Hi everyone. Um, nice to see lots of faces we already know, which is nice. Um, so I'm going to go through the same old etiquette thing. Remember, put yourself on mute, blah de blah. Um, we are using Teams, which is a little bit different to how we usually do these webinars on Zoom, but it should all just work straightforward. Uh, it looks like things are working so far. So hello and welcome. Um, we will start in a couple of minutes. Um, and this is a, a first for us. So um, Cubo, the College and University Business Officers and QOI, which is the Association of College and University Housing Officers, have come together to do this joint webinar, which is, as I said, it's a first really. And that's really uh, exciting because um, when we talk about tech and innovation, there's some really cool and exciting things happening around the world. And what the idea of today's call is to share some of that and share some best practice from um, global perspectives. So not just the UK, uh, which is what we do a lot of talking. It's actually about um, wider than that. So really excited to have some amazing um, people on the call. So first of all, I'll just introduce myself. Um, my name's James. I'm the head of residential life at the London School of Economics. Uh, and I also chair the Cuba Res Life Group, and um, I chair elect the Global Initiatives Network, which is part of a QOI. Um, and so uh, t take on lots of additional things um, for my sins, um, but I enjoy it because I get to find out all of the juicy stuff that's going on in the sector and um, share it out. Um, I do some of this alongside Abigail, who, Abigail, I think you're on the call, and it'd be lovely if you wouldn't mind, Abigail, just introducing yourself from the QOI. Hi everyone, my name is Abigail Smith. I am the um, chair for the Global Initiative Network. Thank you all for joining and being with us. Excited for this partnership with Kubo. So hi Kubo folks. <laughs> Hopefully we can do you know more things um, as the year goes on, but really excited for this webinar. Thank you James and our guests today. Really excited for this discussion. And if you want to get more involved with the Kuwai, feel free, reach out, let me know, let James know so we can get you connected with the Kuwai um, for sure. Thank you. Um, and so the webinar today is around innovation and technology developments within student housing and res life around the world but we could talk generally just outside of that but we're going to try and focus some of the conversation on um, student housing and res life um our, our thinking was that we would spend around 30 to 45 minutes with a bit of a q a with our panelists we've got three panelists and then some time towards the end um, to do a Q&A. We'll make sure this session's recorded and then afterwards it will be posted on the QOI YouTube channel, which we'll send out links to afterwards if you want to share with others. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to get straight into our panellists and do some introductions. Um, hopefully I do them justice, but we'll see. Um, so first of all, we've got um, Matthew Mc McEvoy, um, or Matty as I know him, the Chief Executive um, of Together All. And Together All um, is a 24-7 clinically moderated digital peer-to-peer -peer support service. Uh, and in Matty's role, he leads all as aspects of the T Together All global strategy, which is perfect for this call, um, operations and expansion. So Together All um, has a, a particular focus on young people, uh, or young adults, should we say, supporting over 450 institutions um, in the UK, Ireland, US, Canada, and actually has about 4.5 million students have access to the Together All um, service. So a big, big operation. Um, Matty, you've got loads of information there about you, and I think it's probably best that maybe it comes from you. Is that all right if I hand over to you for the next bit? Because you're there and I don't want to yeah, sure, steal you sure, yeah, next stage. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. It's a bit a bit early where, where I am. I'm based in Canada and Toronto. Um, but have a, a long, long background in student mental health. Have been at Together All for the last four years. But prior to that, um, I've spent my entire career in in mental health with a particular focus on students. So in a prior life, worked for an organization that provided uh, remote, one-to-one -one, uh, based mental health services and supports. Um, and within my remit here in Canada, I sit on the technical committee that wrote a national student mental health standard uh, for post-secondary students for colleges and universities across Canada um, that rolled out um, June of 2020, uh, which we essentially needed to rewrite in light of all the changes that were necessary in the pandemic related to mental health. So happy to be here today and, and share some of my experience. 
Thank you, Matty. That's great. Um, and then the next person we've got on the panel is uh, Mashudu. And Mashudu is a senior clinical psychologist at the University of Pretoria and the senior clinical psychologist at Mind and Body Matters. Um, Mashudu has a particular interest in the use of technology to promote and optimise mental well-being, taking responsibility for mental health, uh, and, and actually a new chatbot um, commonly referred to as uh, WYSA at the University of Pretoria. I read your massive long all sorts of research and things that you've done in this area. There's quite a lot going back uh, over a period of time. I won't give away how long in your age, but is there anything else you want to add in there? No, um, I just want to then just add that, yeah, my role has also always been primarily to look at how do we advance uh, equitable access to mental health resources and also to ensure that there's expansion in information sharing and also minimizing, you know, seeking help, seeking behaviors, help seeking behaviors, and also ensuring that we stick, minimize the stigma that may be associated with mental health seeking behaviors. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then last but not least, we've got Lee Wallinson from um, Homes for Students. Lee's the director at Homes for Students and Homes for Students is one of the UK's largest independent student accommodation providers with around 35,000 studios and rooms. Uh, and Homes for Students are leading the way in, in many different ways in terms of tech innovation in the private accommodation um, sector, including their residence app, which we'll get onto a bit later on in the webinar. But Lee, I know you've done lots of other roles in the sector. Do you want to fill us in with some of that? Yeah, thanks, James. Uh, so been in residential um, sector now for about 25 years, believe it or not. Um, formerly uh, head of accommodation at the University of Liverpool, um, where uh, back in 2012, um, we designed uh, and launched um, uh, one of the first uh, apps to spot early signs of uh, resident um, ill health, um, potential um, self-harm and suicide risk. Uh, and this was the digitization, if you like, of, um, of residential advisor uh, notes, which were then done on paper, uh, emails, Word documents, all of the usual offenders, um, and that brought it into an app so that they could record incidents on their phone uh, in the middle of the night when it was happening, and that would help us then build up a picture over time to help support students. Um, I then left the university after a number of years, uh, went to work for a company called Kinetic Software, and they operate the KX booking platform that's widely used across the sector uh, in um, both commercial services and residential services. Uh, and now I uh, head up the team uh, here at uh, Homes for Students. Um, and that's been a real interesting journey because uh, going from a university setting where you're looking at one city and one specific set of students, um, then into a technology setting where you're looking at how technology can help um, people who are connected to student accommodation, student housing uh, around the world, and now working for a private student operator um, across 55 cities around the UK with over 35,000 beds. Um, that's quite a, a change um, and that's helped in my learning uh, over the years. Uh, so yeah, really pleased to be here and sharing my experiences with everyone today. That's great, thank you. Um, and hopefully this doesn't come across too much like a sales pitch for many of the companies. That's not the idea of today. I wanted some experts in the sector and I didn't really want the same voices that we hear quite a lot um, within the sector. So I wanted people you know, from all different areas, from private sector world, uh, technology world, and also uh, within the university to give a real flavour of what we're looking at in terms of technology and development. So I think we've got a really strong panel there to have some of those discussions. Um, we are also joined by Sarah, um, who's joining us behind the scenes from Cubo, and also Meredith from QOI. So um, there's representation uh, just behind the scenes there. If there's any tech problems, just pop something in the chat and uh, our fantastic team will be able to help. Um, I will jump straight into the questions if that's OK. And one of the first questions is just a general broad question to start off our conversation. And what I wanted to find out really was the key themes that you're seeing when we talk about innovation and technology, especially within student housing and residential life. Are there any key themes that you're seeing or expectations from students at the moment? Um, Mashudu, can I come to you first if that's OK? Can you just repeat what you just said? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to get from you the key themes that you're seeing when we when we talk about technology and innovation. What are the key themes that you're seeing at the moment? 
Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity and platform. I think one of the key themes that we're seeing um, as a university, as particularly as an institute, in terms of the unit that provides uh, student support, we're looking, we're seeing that there's more well-being support applications. Um, uh, for instance, here in the University of Pretoria, we have the chatbot called WISA, which is an AI-driven chatbot. They're billboards that provide students with information about how they can access resources to support their well-being whilst within the residences. We also see patterns uh, or themes emerging in terms of security systems that also promote a sense of safety and comfort through biometric uh, systems um, that also helps to manage and control access within uh, facilities as, of residences. And again, the expansion of Wi-Fi wi connectivity, which it ensures and enables you know, more access and wider access to resources, tools that promote you know, opt optimal well-being of students. So those are some of the themes that are quite pertinent, particularly the use of applications that students have used uh, quite significantly over the years. That's great, thank you. Um, Matty, is there anything you're seeing from Together All, anything across the sector? It doesn't need to be just student housing, so I know you deal with much bigger. Yeah. Than yeah, and, and it actually builds a little bit on on your last point is 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 the proliferation of of apps and platforms. And when I was um, as we were writing the student mental health standard in Canada, we surveyed a whole host of students, both on and off campus, about access to mental health services. And actually, you know, in, we were in a room of probably thirty different mental health professionals, all looking at the issue all together. And the biggest theme that we found is that students didn't know where to go. They knew that there were services available to them, both digital and otherwise, but there was a bit of a confusion and, um, of, of where to go and how to access service. And this was before COVID. Obviously, we've seen a massive proliferation of various digital tools since COVID. And I was just at a, at a conference, um, a higher education conference, in Boston called uh, NASPA for student services. And there's some res life representation there. And um, I had somebody come by, we had, a, we had a booth. I had someone come by the booth who was new to the space and said she went by and stopped to every table and said, did you know that everybody has a platform? And there was probably a hundred vendors. And so this, this proliferation and confusion as to where do we send students for student success, for res life issues, for mental health support, is really a significant concern. I think it's sort of the next frontier. There's one or two vendors really trying to consolidate that space. Um, and you know, in, in terms of mental health, I've had so many different kinds of organizations reach out to us wanting to partner sort of non-traditional types of services. So um, residence life sort of management platforms. I had a, a student um, poster and signage platform reach out to us about mental health support. So this consolidation of, of various technology platforms, I think, is, is going to be something that we'll, we'll see over the next kind of five years or so. I really like that. It's about simplifying the uh, where to go, really, and making the it process is. easier. Because I know even within our own institutions, it can be quite difficult to find the right support for the students, never mind outside of the institution. That's a whole different mind game. So, yeah. Lee, can I come to you next? I know you've worked in and out of different sectors, so it'd be quite interesting to hear your perspective. Yeah, I think the the real challenge is a is a broad set of standards. Um, so going on to to Matty's point earlier on, the the set of standards, um, irrespective of how many systems are used, um, how many different departments there are, how many touch points a student has as they come through. Uh, the move from early years, considering colleges and um, feeder institutions that then come into higher education. Um, all of those systems are all separate, all siloed, um, don't really have a concept of a student journey built into them. They are essentially covering a single point of that person's set up a profile. Probably people get a bit frustrated about setting up multiple profiles and going through the same questions again. Um, and that's before you then start to look at integration of services. Um, we're in a fascinating world with technology, with APIs and the ability to share data, but it's not widely used across the sector um, for the amount of systems 
that we have uh, just in, I remember at the university, just in the residences uh, and commercial departments, there was over 200 different bits of kit that uh, the team had to work on, support, upgrade uh, and integrate. And that was a real challenge for any university uh, IT team. So uh, that can be really difficult for the team that's holding it together for students. Um, again, that concept of a single source of truth or identity. Um, if, if I was a student, I'd, I want to send my fill in my details once and then that profile kind of then stays with me and I shouldn't have to think about filling it in multiple times. So that concept of almost like a passport uh, approach where uh, identity is validated and um, uh, irrespective of which system is used, uh, that concept follows the student all the way through uh, and, and builds and grows and changes uh over the years um i think that's been a really interesting thing to to keep an eye on over the last decade and for sure that's going to be a challenge for us all in the next decade is the concept of data what we do with data and how that then speaks to various other systems within the within the sector thank you that's really great thank you we um definitely have that problem in many institutions i talk to so many universities and they have so many systems and it's it's a bit of a mess. It's a bit of a everything's not really connected. And and from the student perspective, as you said, Lee, they don't really care. You know, I think they just sign up to the brand of that university and they presume it's all connected behind the scenes uh, and that things like single sign on, etc. across different systems it should be a norm, but it isn't. And um, it can be, I guess, quite frustrating. So thank you so much. Um, I was going to just touch now really on our, our wellbeing services because we've got a, we're talking about technology and, technology and innovation but when we talk about res life what what we do is is we support students and we look at their well-being and, uh, and make sure that they're well supported and 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 sometimes our counseling teams and our our, our residencies teams can be overstretched and um, there's only so much that those teams can do within the resource they've got so that's why we wanted together all on the call today, just to talk about some of the work together all are doing to support universities. That what I see together all when I've worked with together all in the in the past at other institutions is kind of an extension of our our team. Um, but it'd be really interested, uh, interesting, sorry, Matty, to hear from you about how you do support universities and what the benefit is to some of those universities. Sure. Yeah. Happy to. Happy to talk about that. I, I think before I talk specifically about some of the work that Together All is doing, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the narrative around yeah. student mental health across, and this is, you know, my, my remit is across many countries. And, and the commonality, I think, is is that there is a, a mental health crisis on campus, and we hear that everywhere. Uh, it's in the news just about every day, depending on on, on where you're looking. And it, it's really interesting because some of the data, I think, certainly backs that up. There's there's more students coming to university and college counseling and well-being centers uh, clear across the world and, and, it, and it's certainly all the countries where we work. But I think it, it's also we've been a bit of a victim of our own success. You know, we spent, um, Shudu, you mentioned kind of breaking down stigma and barriers to access to support. And I've been in this, this world a long time and we've spent the last 20 years encouraging uh, young people in colleges and universities to put their hands up and say, I need help. We've done a huge amount of gatekeeper training, particularly focused on residence life, because that's where a lot of the issues can be first spotted about if you see someone who's struggling, bring them to the counseling center. And that narrative over and over again for 20 years, um, as I sort of said, we've been a bit of a victim of our own success. So everybody's now doing that. The unfortunate part is that uh, resources for mental health support on campuses. So more case managers, more counselors, more psychiatrists in certain large campuses haven't kept up with that demand and the, the breaking down of stigma. Um, and that's resulted, I think, in sort of what I can hear consistently in, in sort of the stretching of our counseling and well-being teams. Interesting, though, like to, to sort of counter this idea of a crisis on campus related to mental health, and this is any, I was just looking at some U.S. data recently, is that actually the number of, of suicides on campuses has actually largely been flat 
over the last 20 years. And in the U.S., it's actually even had a slight decrease over the last couple of years. So a bit of a mismatch between what's out there in the, in the news and the media and, and what actually is being seen on campuses. Um, but part, part of what we, our philosophy at Together All, James, to, to your point, in terms of being an extension, is this concept of both and, right? We need to continue to invest both in clinical capacity on our campuses, because we know that there are, there are significant prevalence issues of mental health concerns, students are coming forward, and we need to keep building that capacity to keep up with demand. We need to continue to have innovative practices like putting uh, counselors in large residence halls so access is easy and timely. Um, and at the same time, think about how might we approach counseling and support a little bit differently. So I'm really curious to hear what's happening with, with Liza on, on your campus, which you do in, in just a minute. Um, but, you know, our approach is, is a population-wide approach to mental health. It's making, you know, what we think about a basic level of mental health supports available to as many students as possible. Um, educating folks in residence life to say, if you have a student who's really worried about an exam that's happening the next day or in two days from now, they may not need counseling. They may actually be better served by a, a peer support group who, you know, that's a normative, regular student experience to be stressed and concerned about what's coming up or if you've broken up with a, a girlfriend or boyfriend and that sort of thing. There's lots of other places to go, together all being one of them, to receive support um, and rather than pathologize what is really a, a normative human and a normative student experience. There's lots of different ways to think about that. Um, and that's part of our goal at, at Together All is, is creating a safe and supportive space where students can come to get connected with others, to share what's been happening in their lives and actually realize that, wow, what I'm experiencing, thousands of other students are experiencing right here in the same moment as I am and, and normalize that experience. And sure, some of those students are gonna need more than what peer support or, or what chatbots or what self-help tools can provide. And we need to have clear pathways to guide them to mental health support. But in this idea of both and, we can help share the load of, of that demand that's coming forward to a, to a campus counseling center. Um, and so we spend a lot of time uh, together all thinking about how do we work really closely with counseling and well-being teams and res life teams and other departments to, to, to support that. Thank you, Matty. That's really, uh, really great. I'm just picking up on a couple of points. So you were talking about obviously normalising um, students reaching out to support, but I like the the peer support element and the other kind of uh, exercises that can be done within the app and the platform, which isn't your high end clinical counselling and, and a lot of the students that we deal with. Actually, that's what that's all they need. They just need, uh, first of all, a listening ear and then second of all, uh, an output. Uh, which doesn't always need to be a trained counsellor. And, and and some of that might connect with some of the stats you just gave there in terms of suicide rates and, and uh, a drop there in the States. Yeah. That okay. Actually, we're dealing with a lot more low-level things rather than, uh, you know, the high level. There's a really interesting stat that just an, another American stat from the Center for Collegiate Mental Health, which is an organization that has a standardized data set across 700 counseling centers across the U.S. And over the last two years, the highest um, increase in prevalence among sort of presenting issues to a counseling center is actually social isolation. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, obviously, I think, you know, coming out of the pandemic or still in the pandemic, depending on how you view it, um, it it's no surprise. But things like social isolation, social anxiety are really well suited for lower levels of, of intervention and, and keeping, you know, the, the, the really clinical services for folks who really, really need that type of intervention. The other bit about Together All is that we've got uh, licensed clinicians who are monitoring the community 24 hours a day. Um, the service is also anonymous, and we tend to be uh, a first port of call for a lot of students, particularly students who come from marginalized communities. Or, uh, you know, for example, we see a lot of transgender students joining the Together All community who may be less likely to reach out. So I think some of these digital tools that are available, you know, Together All being one of them, can also be a great first port of call. Uh, but then having clear pathways when we see a student who, who needs more than what some of those self-help or peer support can provide. And that's why we've kind of had that clinical moderation 
to make sure that what's happening in our space is safe and supportive and, and a clear line to get to more intensive levels of care. Great, thank you, that's great. Um, what I'm gonna do is just move, so we've heard from Matty together all, but I'm just gonna move into the university sector. So um, Majudu, if you could just give us some flavor of what you've been doing around the chat bot, the success, any learnings, uh, and if we're thinking of doing it at our universities, is there anything, any tips you could give us? Um, thank you so much. I just want to just add on to what my colleague just mentioned earlier on that there are multiple levels of intervening when we come into the mental health of students. And one of our pyramid or strategic models that we use in the student counseling unit is looking at primary prevention. Um, as indicated, not all students may present with severe pathology, but they may need the resources, for example, how to manage their time, how to just manage it, uh, test anxiety, uh, which may not necessarily be pathological, but you know the stress of I'm anxious, I'm going to write a test, how do I calm down, how do I regulate myself uh, at this point in time when there's so much sensory disintegration. Um, and as the student counseling unit during the advent of COVID, um, we had to, you know, change so much in terms of how we were operating. We in a short period of time had to change from being in the office to being complete, completely virtual. But then we looked at how do we also ensure that there's still equitable access, there's still equitable resources available to students given that there's a great gap between the ratio of staff versus the population. But also how then do we intervene at a primary level and then there was the development of the Scooby chatbot, um, which I'll explain how to we did Scooby get wiser. Uh, then it was it was a chatbot that provided basic mental health resources and tools to students. And what we also found quite significant, which also looked at helps us look at how can we advance this, this um, primary health uh, tool that preventative tool that we provide for students was that during the 23rd to the 31st of December in 2021, there was around 55 interactions meaning students reaching out. This is the period in which generally the university is closed down officially, except for the buildings and infrastructure and security uh, essential services. But then what we also noticed when we also had Scooby was that on the 1st of January, we had about 413 students um, you know, engaging on the chat pod. This then said, how then can we expand, um, you know, reach to students? How can we also continue to provide these resources? And we then look at how artificial AI has also been in advanced, how we can also, you know, improve our mental well being. And that's how the Scooby became Wiser. So, uh, Wiser is our new AI chat pod that we've launched in, in February this year. Uh, that the students can be able to access it as a primary mental health preventative tool. It has over 152 resource tools. They are CBT orientated. CBT looks at how our thoughts, cognitions have a direct relationship on how we're going to respond, how we're going to behave. Um, so it also has a variety of tools that can help students in terms of the coping strategies, the management of stress, the management of the anxiety, as well as link them to resources. For instance, if students use words like, I'm giving up, I can't take it anymore, it will prompt. It will also link them to our UP Care Line. Our UP Care Line is a 24-hour available service for students to access their mental health support by speaking to a um, counselor or mental health practitioner, uh, which they can always reach out to. So it only not only provides them with tools, but it also provides them with access. And ever since we've seen the launch of WISA in February this year, we've had over 47,000 interactions, digital interaction. Um, again, this says a lot to, uh, uh, as, as a service offering, it's amongst the assortment of services we offer that says that students indeed may not always need to see a psychologist per se, but they may need to check in where it affects their mind, where it affects their body, how can they cope with you know, their day-to-day -day basis, how can they also start to develop small concrete goals for themselves in order to improve the overall well-being. So this is what WISA is currently being offered for students within the university. And this is what we're also learning in terms of the data and also we are using, going to use the data that we are collecting at this point in time for the pilot, which we'll also share once um, uh, the, 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 the pilot phase has, has completed to share what are some of the learnings we've made and what, have, what we have seen so far. But what we can share, you know, as colleagues is that 
uh, digital innovation and digital technology can also help to be a bit of a bridge between the gap, mental health gap that we see. And it can also be in the comfort of the student space in the residence. And it's anonymous, so we will never know who is writing, what are they saying. But it also helps us to also pick up on the conversational agent's language. What is the words that students are commonly using? Um, as a practitioner or as a professional, I may use um, bipolar mood disorder to describe mood or what a, a patient is presenting with. But they may say stress, can't sleep. You know, they may not use the word insomnia. What is the words that we're also picking up in terms of how do we also expand you know, future technologies? So this is what one of the offerings that we provide to students within the university. It is amongst assortments, you know, other services that we also provide to students. But this is a primary preventative tool that I could encourage other institutes also to um, to use such um, as it facilitates you know interaction it normalizes getting help um, it normalizes self-seeking behavior and it also destigmatizes um, stigma associated with you know seeking mental health or checking in with your mental health and also ensuring that students are always in track you know what is also nice with YZ is this little uh, reminder that you can select the time once you set your goals, every day you'll check in. How have you been doing? Have we met our goals? And, and uh, you know, um, in a way, um, encourage students to also look at the positive aspects of the small things. Uh, you know, being grateful for the small goals that they were able to achieve in the in the day to day, which uh, culminates to them doing much better. Um, some of the tool packs that we see students using on the chat uh, on the chat board is like tool packs that helps them, for example, with sleep. Um, you know, they're using a lot of sleep activities and sleep tools that help them, you know, manage them, their sleep, which is a very common problem that students experience, you know, different during different academic periods, especially during when exam periods are much more closer. Um, so that's in summary, we're quite excited um, of how the sunset of Scooby has, you know, ri risen the uh, uh, wiser and how this continues to be one of the platforms that we provide mental health digital literacy to our student population, especially also within the residence field. Great, thank you. Really interesting to hear about WISA um, and also that thousands of students are using it, which um, is, is, is very impressive. Um, when you do do that kind of summary of the learnings and you've done kind of the whole cycle, it'd be really interesting if we could, we as a group could hear some of that, because I'd love to share that out with the QOI and um, for us to to share your knowledge, really, and expertise. And 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 yeah, hopefully we can all look at um, development of chatbots. I just a question because I, I, I mean, I'm not a technology expert, but I try my best um, in terms of the chatbot. Obviously, there's lots of and resources that are pumped out to students and you were saying there's a 24 7 support line to um that students can access through the chatbot obviously if the chatbot can't answer the questions is there somebody else is there would it go to somebody a real life person if if uh, it can't answer the questions or how does that work so if for instance that um the chatbot picks up that the student is saying incoherent words, um, you know, uh, things that are words that do not make sense. It will directly link them to the care line. However, if they um, may not be able to understand or respond, it will keep prompting. Um, it will not directly link them to a live person um, as if they, as in the event where they speak to um, or say sentences that are not coherent, maybe because they may be psychotic at that point in time. So it'll help pick that up. Uh, and direct them to the UP care line, but there isn't a physical um, uh, person uh, that is uh, in, in real time able to, you know, directly speak to the student there. Yeah, that makes sense. That's really useful. Now, and you said earlier around there was about 152 different tools that behind the chat box. I'm sure a lot of what the student needs is there anyway, which is it's really mm -hmm. great, really interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Masudu. I'm going to come over to Lee, because Lee, um, I know within um, student housing and, and we talk about community building quite a lot in Res Life, and I know with Homes for Student, you guys have got your own app, a residence app, um, and I always forget the name of it. I think it begins with K, and you'll correct Click. me. Click, I was nearly there. Um, and so I just really want to hear about Click, because we've talked a little bit about Chatbot there, and, and actually Click does 
some um, functionality and, and some other areas too. And I was at a presentation recently where you talked about it and it, and it sounded wonderful. We want to know more about Click. OK, um, yeah, I think it, it, it came from the, um, the, the the topic of building community and um, just, you know, we've, we've talked already just now around chatbots and a lot of AI and a lot of the way technology can help with the large, uh, high volume, but low value uh, interactions. So uh, a lot of the large caseload that kind of overwhelms counselling services and being able to protect those teams from um, lo more low level, uh, low mood or general uh, uh, anxiety. And um, one of the things that I guess is a consideration for AI and technology is how does it help to build a community? Because we we all know, you know, years in the sector, um, uh, friendships, friendship groups can really be a good support system and a support network. And I think um, just some observations as the sector's moved away from long corridors, non en suite in many universities now, all the way through to en suite clusters uh, and then studio accommodation. I think there's that consideration of loneliness. And I think Matty talked on that before uh, around that kind of isolation factor um, and also look at the way social media has evolved, uh, how taking photos proves that something happened and people liked it um, rather than actually memories uh, that we all just keep to ourselves and private. Everything is overshared on social media and that concept of true friendship um, sometimes is, is, is harder to form. Um, so, so we looked at some of the observations over the years and um, in-house developed our own app to build community. And it, it works on a reverse principle of rather than being an established system that then students are kind of loaded into and it's, it figures it all out, it's the opposite. So um, every year, students uh, who live uh, in our properties across the, the UK, they uh, tell us freely uh, we don't um, force them to volunteer information, but freely they tell us um, about their interests, their hobbies, um, things that they would like uh, or are interested in. Uh, and that changes every year. So one year it could be gaming, the next year it could be films, uh, and, and that changes. And that allows us ahead of time to build a sense of community and build our um, residential programme of events and activities um, to uh, in, in advance based on the needs or interests of the students that are coming to live with us. Uh, and this year in a number of universities that we partner with um, from a nominations or referral arrangement uh, across the country, um, we've worked with the universities to share some of that information with them. So this gives a really early insight to data that isn't n necessarily available at, at the time that students check in to their university or enrol on their course. So that's been really insightful and, and interesting across the country. Um, but the concept of using personalised data that the students have given us um, around their interests and hobbies uh, to build the events programme around them and um, just some kind of uh, stats on, on how that's worked for us. We launched it back in November last year um, and we've already had over 25,000 downloads. Uh, so this isn't a concept, this isn't a pilot, this is this is, is now and it's it's been in use for this cycle so far. Um, over the country, we've had um, over 5,000 events and crucially, students are able to give us feedback on events so we can ensure that events are hitting the mark. Um, it's not always high budget activities. It could be a walking tour to help orientate students around their city or their campus. They're really popular. Um, students on average have rated events 4.73 out of five stars, uh, which is really heartening and in encouraging to see. Um, it also has functionality for parcels uh, and that's we deliberately um, uh, had parcel functionality because I think where a lot of apps go wrong is they try and be a Swiss army knife and do everything. You know, you can pay your rent, report repairs. It all sounds really convenient, but it makes the experience quite transactional. Um, as in, you know, I've got something that I need to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and there's no real interaction level there. But parcels, um, as we all know in universities, in, in any residence across the world, parcels are a global problem, um, are a challenge, uh, and 
we so far have had over 326,000 parcels. Um, as a parcel comes in, we're able to um, give a, a notification to the students that their parcel has arrived. We combine multiple parcel deliveries for the student and give them a share code that they can share with one of their flatmates to pick up parcels on their behalf. Um, and that's been really, really good at building that sense of community within a flat, reducing flat disputes as well, which is a, um, a, a really nice um, uh, bonus uh, to this. Uh, we've had over 28,000 bookings of communal spaces in our properties. So you, you look at common rooms, you look at communal spaces and you always think, how are the students going to use it? But by by giving them a platform to be able to book that space out, they are always the experts. They are going to book the spaces and do things that we couldn't create. Um, they're always going to have that um, spontaneous uh, wanting to book something, maybe it's someone's birthday or they've got an event or a society that want to have a meeting in the space. And that's been really good. So, so finding friends early on, breaking down the barriers that social media has built up over the last decade has been really powerful for us. Um, and we're really excited to share some of the learnings with the sector. And um, pretty much we have a building somewhere uh, locally to you uh, uh, that are taking part in this session today. So uh, please feel free to reach out to me and happy to share some experiences and just that added dimension of what we have learned from the student population that lives in those properties. Um, but it's been it's been really well embraced. Um, and it's it's not, you know, we're not a technology company. We provide student housing across the UK. So um, it's been very interesting for us to develop it in-house. It didn't exist in the sector, so we had to go out and build it um, and build it ourselves. Um, but it, it also helps us uh, communicate better with students. So one of the failings of property management systems or booking systems that we all use uh, for student accommodation is their ability to communicate and send emails that look attractive and students open them and crucially read them. Uh, so having push notifications has really helped. Um, and one final thing just before I hand back to you, James, is, is the survey responses. So for years at the university, I really struggled to get our student survey response numbers up. Um, and again, serving rather than sending them an email through our booking system uh, and students click it or don't, um, sending them a push notification through the app um, has meant that over half of our survey responses have been um, via the app. So that's a really interesting stat um, that students are responding really well to that mechanism of serving a communication rather than a, quite an anonymous system generated email that's not really personalised. So that's been an interesting uh, observation so far. It sounds dreamy to me. Uh, <laughs> I was saying before when we started um, this call that we, I know in my institution, we have loads of systems and, and not all of them talk to each other. And I think the students get quite frustrated with the fact that we're not joined up into one single kind of point of access. So an app like that sounds great. And it sounds like also it, it's quite a personalised journey and quite personalised to the user rather than a general approach, which is quite nice. Uh, and I agree with the whole um, Instagram bit that you mentioned about you have to shout on Instagram or it didn't happen. It doesn't happen. I went out with my team last night. And the first thing was like, let's get the food on Instagram because we weren't here if we didn't put it on Instagram. Um, but yeah, no, that's really great. Thank you, Lee. Um, I'm going to that's all positive and we've been really positive so far. And I'm going to touch on some of the doom and gloom stuff, unfortunately. Um, when we talk about tech and innovation and, and and a big problem when we work in universities, big complex universities, which which they are, they're big organisations with many different stakeholders, um, operations not just within their home country, operations globally too, which adds uh, another dimension when we talk about tech and innovation. And so with all of that, it can be quite slow sometimes to see progress, especially when we talk, talk about technology and innovation and there's there can be red tape, there can be blocks through that process and, and it's really frustrating and I'm sure lots of people on the call can, will probably agree with me that it's one of the most biggest frustrations is seeing change in universities and in and, and higher education. Um, and so I'd just like to know your thinking on that. How, how, how have you found that in terms of um, working in either universities or working with universities to, to push that change? 
and what have been some of the challenges. Um, Majudu, if I could come to you because you've just you work within the university and you're obviously an innovator in technology, but how you have you found it within the institution? I think uh, the institution is very um, pro innovation and also um, digital technology and digital transformation. Um, if I can give an example of our unit, during the, the advent of COVID, we then completely went into electronic uh, patient record system in which all records of students are now stored. It is not only used by our unit, even health uh, services, the disability unit um, is able to ensure that all information of students is captured in one uh, platform that even in the event that there's a fire or natural disaster, all the those records can always be kept and we can always use them remotely. If we you know, go through another pandemic where we may not have uh, interaction or social engagements, we may still then be able to continue uh, because all the information about you know clients are recorded um, in terms of you know what has been happening, who has seen them, and also I think the expansion of what we I was just indicating earlier on with with Wisa, it's also another expansion of how do we ensure that we expand the service offering. Um, to ensure that there's an assortment. We also have like your website where all the information about booking for services is available. Other um, services such as podcast services that we provide um, and also other poster information that you know students may need or require around that promotes and supports their well-being. So I think that is something that is already being done, um, you know, that's improving uh, in terms of how universities, we are also one of the uni big universities in South Africa with, um, you know, other campuses. And this is also, I think, another initiative that you know, expands on the existing pro um, provisions. Of offerings. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Matty, your experience working with the universities, I always get a bit embarrassed when I have to talk to a third party. I think, here we go, we have this got conversation. But what, what's your experiences, Matty? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think I think there is a, an acceptance and a desire to push technology forward uh, at a college or university. And, and, and when, you know, we work with with individuals within a well-being team or a student success team or a res life team, there is so much enthusiasm for the kind of work that we're doing. And some of what I've heard from from Liam Shudu today is, I think, echoes that. Where we where we see the big problem, though, is and this is clear across the board, is actually getting it through the right hoops uh, within a college or university. So there is someone will solve this uh, issue, but of IT. Uh, acceptance uh, and um, maybe quick movement and a standard that can be developed across institutions where our team probably spends the most amount of time is answering the same questions about data security, privacy, um, the legal, that sort of thing, sort of over and over again. And it's the same handful of issues that that crop up at every single institution. And so I think it I wind up hearing from all of our kind of key contacts. We've got the budget, we've got the desire, let's roll it out. But sometimes we can be delayed six months, 12 months, and actually removing support from students who need it because of some internal red tape and, and bureaucracy. And so, um, you know, there's hopefully a technologist out there somewhere who can solve that problem and standardize some of these, um, some of these kind of questions and, and data issues. But uh, not not us yet together all. Uh, our focus is mental health, but would love it if somebody could could figure that out. Thank you, Lee. Did you see you've worked you've done a stint working obviously quite a while in in the university sector, and um, I know you're definitely not one of those. We've always done it this way kind of people, but um, yeah, what's your experiences? It's ironic, isn't it? Um, anything outside the sector. So if you look at social media. Um, I know there'll be people on this call that the university has only just had a social media policy put through all the committees, and uh, how do we uh, how do we manage that, or uh, you know make sure that uh, there's appropriate behavioural standards on social media, either representing the institution or for students and staff students and that all of those relationships. And um, it, it is a challenge and it's ironic how something that exists outside of the sector like social media is so unregulated. Uh, and yet the core essential systems and tools that all of the professionals that are on this call and watching this uh, webinar 
need to use day to day that they're, they're, they're mission critical to their success every day that and the success of their students so it's it's ironic that so much uh, regulation exists within uh, those systems and uh, social media kind of everyone just jumps on board the next you know look at tiktok two years ago no one at all no universities were using or thinking of TikTok. It was all very much kind of Instagram and Twitter, and those are the usual staples of you know Facebook groups, the usual staples of of uh, the sector. And then TikTok arrives, and all of a sudden, kind of the rules change again. So it, 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 I think it's that series of of standards, and I think Matty is probably closest to this in terms of the work that he's already done in previous lives and and the current one around kind of that approved that agreed principles and standards almost like a an api matty i guess like um, an integration with technology if someone could work to develop that kind of almost like kind of approved um platform that that has a series of standards like the web you know an internet browser has a series of standards websites have a series of standards that everyone uses that that will make the some of the pain um a lot easier it's not always within one person's gift so actually all of us on this call are the innovators um if you go outside of these channels uh, at your peril um outside of student accommodation and student housing things get slow very quickly so uh that is often the the challenge and um i think that's one of the good things that we've found um more recently with 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 developing our own app is we're, we're not a technology company so our our relationship with the university is very much around these are your students that already live with us here's some information that might help you um in terms of yeah. understand more about them and understand some of the trends that are going on at a at your university level but also around the city across other institutions where a city has more than one university that's that's a really interesting insight as well um i, I think just was all supporting each other is is probably the the way isn't it um it's it's not just someone giving financial approval it's now more how do we bring this into our platform and our offering and and, and truly innovate um to solve a specific problem so building community that challenge is always going to exist student well-being that's not going away uh, so those are, are real cornerstones of how we can innovate and a space that that has and will see continued innovation um, I'm not 100% pro chatbots. Um, I think I've I've certainly done a lot of um, in, you know research in in that space and and the the use of technology, but the, there's got to be a human connected to that. Whether that's a human looking at some of the responses or questions or spotting the language and understanding patterns. Um, machines work best with well organized structured data. Humans can work with messy data and it, things that don't naturally make sense. So probably innovation um, will exist more when there's a human element to it and, and a requirement for human interaction. Don't underestimate the hard work of your residential advisors and RAs across the whole uh, sector. Uh, they are students themselves often and a lot gets placed on them. So, um, you know, using that community to help co-create and shape is probably a good way to innovate from within. Um, because those guys are really close. They're closer than all of us. We all get older every year. Students will stay the same age at 17, 18. So we have to work harder to be relevant in their world, um, as we're all finding. Um, so I think innovating from within and, and, and sharing. And that's why Cubo and QOI are really good platforms to bring people together. And um, I, th I think it's been really great so far just having these open conversations uh, around the sector. Uh, long may that continue. Yeah, thank you. It's good just to, I mean, we are talking about negatives within our institutions and the frustrations, but it's good just to share and get reassurance that it's not just me sometimes or others on the call and our own institutions. We've all got our, the same shared problems, haven't we? Um, but, but, you know, that can be slow, that progress sometimes when we talk about innovation and technology. And, and one point I wanted to touch on, and I did want to mention the horrible C word and the pandemic and COVID, um, but that 
that pandemic had such a profound impact on our sector and, and innovation, not just our sector, many sectors, and it and it really sped up and and um, removed a lot of those internal blocks because we had no choice. We had a time frame and we had to make some changes very very quickly without going to X committee and getting approval and all of the the internal bureaucracy, which was which was amazing. Actually, I thrived through pandemic because I thought yes all the things I've been asking for for years I'm getting in a in a short time frame um but but it'd be nice to hear um from the pandemic what are the what are the positive outcomes in terms of in innovation what things in your institutions you know were, were really kind of pushed to the forefront and um, Majid, Majid do you you met you mentioned before about um the student records they were digital which is great absolutely fantastic is there anything else at the University of Pretoria which was which was really fast tracked and and it's helped the student experience now. So I think what is fast tracked is what uh, the rest of the global world also experienced in terms of you know providing telehealth um, through Zoom calls, also telephone calls. That was also the common the other positive outcome as well in terms of digital innovation and also the new ways of working. Um, but also what we also noticed is the collaboration even during in that period of time that we're not only just working in silos, we work with other stakeholders, how we collaborate, you know, through engagements, through other webinars that we also organize during that period of time and also um, group activities that also when the when the when it was now permissible to have groups, um, you know, that also brought back that social touch. Uh, that social interaction that uh, we see amongst a lot of our students are almost grappling uh, with some of the secondary uh, psychological consequences of COVID that there's a, there's a missing, uh, you know, skill in terms of the, their social interaction. You'd see a lot of students indicating that I'm struggling to make friends. And um, if I remember the time when I was still a student, it was like, yeah, it was so easy. You know, you just were in a line and be like, hey, what are you registering for? You know, and there wasn't that opportunity. And now we just move from a space where on one moment we were told that we cannot com communicate, we cannot engage physically. And then we just had to be reintroduced back to campus again with everyone you've had physically met and everyone is confused. They've never been to the campus. You know, it's, it's also a new experience of like, are we still going to go back? There's also a lot of anxiety of how do we reintegrate? And the collaboration as well was another positive spin off in conjunction with the telehealth and, you know, the expansion of the digital mental health provisions, which students could now access as a result. And also a patient record system that also makes sure that, you know, records are, are safely stored and kept. Um, you know, for, you know, pay, uh, record keeping and also for referencing, if we need to refer, if we need to look at previous reports, you can just draw up from a, uh, a, a client's, you know, information uh, file, then you can be get, able to get all records. Who did they see when and what time and on what date? Yeah. I really so like that. Positive outcomes. Uh, we cannot ignore the negative, you know, uh, psychological consequences, which we are still managing. And I think we'll still manage going to the future of what was impacted in terms of the students as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, I agree. I think we've got a whole generation that um, are impacted and will be impacted for the rest of their lives, actually. This isn't a short term thing. Um, yeah, uh, you talked quite a lot around collaboration and and I love the word collaboration and um, it's so important in this sector to collaborate, not just within the institution, but across the sector and find out what others are doing and share some of that good stuff. Uh, I know working at LSE in that short time frame during the pandemic, we were able to um, expand the use of a system like Salesforce and, and really map out student journey through Salesforce and have quite an advanced track and trace system, which I didn't see elsewhere in the sector, um, or our, our internal track and trace, not NHS, which was um, great to see. So there was some innovation. It was nice to see that. Um, Matty, I'm just going to come to you because I wonder whether you got lots of requests during the pandemic from various institutions wanting to join and uh, we, 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 yeah, we, we absolutely did. And I think what, and I would echo all of what Mashuda said, because I think that we saw, I saw that across the sector. I really, you know, I mentioned before sort of the downside of, of IT implementations and some of the, the red tape that can happen. But when you think about how quickly counseling and well-being centers went from 
entirely in person and literally within days entirely remote. The ability is there to do that, you know, when uh, all the stars align and, and the, the professionals in place within institutions can, can make things happen really quickly in really powerful ways, which was which was amazing to see. The, the other thing I, I think um, that broad attention is, is how acutely everyone all around the world was feeling that sense of isolation, right? And so that sense of normalization of, wow, this is hard for me. Imagine what our students must be feeling really raised, I think, what had been a, a pretty significant issue in the days prior, the years prior to uh, prior to COVID around, you know, student mental health and the, 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 the increasing demand and put it on the, the president's or the provost desks in a way that it wasn't before. Um, it was always there. It was always an important issue. Uh, but throughout the pandemic, there was a recurring survey that was done uh, by the American Council on Education or ACE around what are the most pre pressing issues for you as a university president and clear all the way through were student mental health issues, staff mental health issues, even above sort of declining enrollment. Right, which you know is the financial stability of, of an institution, but student mental health throughout was was number one, and you know I just don't think we ever would have seen that. And so you know to your point, James, around did we get lots of requests? You know, ab absolutely. I think the number of institutions that we've supported since the pandemic has probably doubled. Um, there was, um, and there now has been, I think, a significant amount of funding. That's come because it's on the president's or the provost's desk that has come towards mental health, uh, increasing, as I was saying before, both clinical capacity. So I'm hearing more and more institutions bringing in more counselors to support the needs in person and also supporting some of the digital mental health tools, telemental health, telehealth, and the kind of population health support that that together all provides. And that's here to stay, right? That's been a really significant change, and those methods of support aren't aren't going anywhere. And I think we'll just see an increasing need for them as students, younger students are, to your other point, James, um, who are now maturing and becoming college and university age, who had a gap of three years of, you know, social development, right? Key critical pieces of a young person's development in as teenage years is through interactions with peers and understanding what it's like to, you know, get upset with a friend and, and, and have some disagreements and you know, without that and the isolation that occurs, is we're going to be we're going to be feeling the effects of that pandemic in this young generation for for years to come. Yeah, thank you, Matty. That's great. Um, I'm just worried about time because we've got a few other points to cover. But what I'm going to do is um, shake it up and go to our audience, if that's okay. Just in the interest of time, we've got about 15, 20 minutes left. So if anybody's got any questions, just feel free to pop up your hand, or if you want to pop it in the chat, and I can read out some of those questions. Um, to our panel. I can see some names in the list of people that are usually quite vocal, so I expect we can have some raised hands, which would be quite nice. Um, hopefully I don't have to pick on anybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, pop your hand up if you want to talk, or just unmute yourself if you can't pop your hand. Um, Lange, do you have anything? You usually have lots to to put into these conversations. Maybe not. Silence. We must have done a really good job. Oh, here you go. I'm not able to chat at the moment. <laughs> oh, <okay>. no worries. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I had a question really, I guess, for everyone um, in the room, and, and that was, um, as we've seen kind of the pandemic um, in some cases help galvanise collaboration and um, almost press a bit of a reset button uh, and realign thinking uh, across institutions for rapid innovation and um, a new kind of um, uh, reset. Um, a lot of universities are telling me that they're looking not to necessarily continue with um, investing in large capital projects. So closing old residences and building new projects, they require significant millions and millions of pounds of development. Um, it was really just a question for around the room. Um, is any of that investment getting directed into technology and improving technology and the, the systems and ways of working? Um, 
the, the reason I ask is a lot of universities have approached us around um, a housing requirement. Uh, yes. In some cities, there is a housing shortage uh, for students that are through no fault of their own uh, booking their accommodation in the normal time frames. And by the time they're ready, um, housing just isn't there. Or a lot of HMO housing for second years uh, and third years. So for, for international colleagues, that's um, when students will move out of the university campus housing and go and take a private rental uh, elsewhere. Um, in the UK, we've seen that in many cities this year um, reduce because of tax laws, regulations, and a lot of landlords selling up. Um, and as a result, that's put a squeeze on housing. So it's really just a question for the room to see. First of all, does any ring fenced capital project money found its way back into helping you guys out with um, kind of the systems that you use? Uh, and secondly, um, uh, are you noticing kind of housing shortages in a in a city where you are? I'm happy to kick off the conversation, Lee. So um, from LSE, I mean, London's a different a different ball game, and I think that we have to look at that separately in terms of student housing because we don't have enough housing and won't have enough housing for quite a while now until developers uh, have the time. Um, and I think when we talk about capital and, um, and money behind the scenes, it's different for every institution. I know at LSE we're quite lucky that we've got some of that funding and we are looking at developing some some super kind of halls quite soon, one of them potentially being the biggest hall in Europe once it's completed in the next few years. Um, so we are still doing that. And when we look at mental health and wellbeing, we're also looking for the first time at putting, as was mentioned before on the call, we're looking at putting full-time counselling teams within those buildings, which hasn't been done much in the UK before um, due to the size, nearly a 2,000 bed property. So we'll have almost a 24 hour counselling team in the property. Um, but, but technology, what we're looking at in terms of the tech is that how can we have the absolute best technology in that building? Not just from a customer service point of view, but lots of touch points in terms of things like sustainability and being able to manage things. Um, kind of not even just flat by flat, but room by room and, and do lots of student engagement initiatives through that, that data and technology. So we want to be able to say, you know, the, the person that's um, been the most sustainable through electricity or whatever um, that day or that week and, and measure all of that. Uh, our older buildings and our older stock just doesn't have the tech inbuilt to do all of that kind of cool stuff. So um, we are looking at every fine detail now of, of those um, buildings, but but some of the stuff you mentioned before about the app and having the right property management system to manage all of that will be the next point of call because you can't expand really quickly without having the tech behind the operation. Otherwise, there will be a point of failure at some point. Um, but I could go on and on and I'll be really boring. Um, is there anybody else that wants to come in here? Elizabeth, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in first? Hello. Um, I can't speak to the first question, Lee, because we are based in student support services at Cardiff University for Res Life, so I don't get privy to that type of information. I hope to get invited to discussion boards, but I don't actually know. Um, I know that we have land, though, that's sitting there waiting to be built on, and we haven't had the capital to build accommodation onto it. There are plans, and they're beautiful, and they haven't come to fruition. The priority for us has been academic buildings and things during the pandemic. Um, but to the second point, there's absolutely a housing crisis in Cardiff. Um, we have struggled especially to house our um, Erasmus EU students coming over who are only coming for a semester. They don't have the sort of luxury, I guess, of signing a 40 week contract. And that means that they're less attractive um, to, to developers and builders who want to want to let, let out their properties. So that's been a real stress this year and so much so that we've had to take um, RLA sort of res life rooms and put students in them when we've had vacancies, which we haven't had to do in the past. We've sort of been able to sort of hold those in case we find somebody good mid-year and we, we haven't been able to do that. We've just had to chuck students into them, which was the right thing to do. But I think it speaks to how how much students are struggling and how much they need support and it's been really interesting to hear all of these ideas and the things going on and to say I don't have a question because I'm still mulling over everything that I've been writing down um, so thank you to everyone it's fascinating to hear what you're doing across the globe um, and I'm really grateful for it so thank you thank you so much 
Um, uh, I think I would just want to comment to say that um, I also don't work directly under student uh, residences. I work under student affairs. And the housing crisis, I think it's a global issue. Also in South Africa, I think what is affecting most of our students in South Africa currently who are on the national um, funding scheme is that they had cut down the cost of what they can be able to cover for accommodation and that is way lower than what the cost would be around so that leaves most students maybe in a very difficult space financially because now they need to top up and you know the cost of living has significantly increased so has the cost of residences so i think that is a challenge that i'm aware of that is also happening at a national level where government is now engaging the institutions the residences on solutions around what can then be done if there's only specific amounts that can be provided for students. Um, yes, in some contexts, South Africa is so diverse, even in terms of resources. The bigger cities have better resources. The smaller cities, rural contexts are much uh, under-resourced. And you know, if you're going to give the same amount for all students, it, it, it also creates a bit of a difficult uh, space for students who may be in spaces where they may not be able to adequately pay for the amount of money that's available. So I think that's just what I can say in terms of, you know, around the um, crisis of student housing and what we're experiencing in South Africa. Um, but what I also can say around the support is that we work closely with the student residences. We, you know, conduct or form part of their uh, well-being uh, initiatives whenever they have workshops. We are invited, engage, and also the resources that we've received from management on the promotion and, and prevention of mental health disorders. We also spill it on as well within the residences. So that's just what I can just comment on you know your your question around uh, the um, the residence um, crisis. I think it's still a global concern and may continue to be. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anybody else, Simon? You've just appeared. I don't know if you've got something you wanted to to add in. <laughs> I, I think there's there's lot going on. I think your point about how do we future proof existing accommodation is very relevant. I think we have seen a big investment in residential life at Queen Mary, primarily because of the uh, sort of students that we have at Queen Mary, which can be, you know, first from family, uh, single parent, care leavers and that retention. So I'm not so sure it's um, as clear as it's suddenly because they work up and saw a philanthropic endeavour and felt we need that support. Part of it is about that retention and the income. Uh, I think there are huge challenges with the overseas markets and the reliance on them for a lot of that income and that rebalancing. Um, expectations of student housing, ours are a reasonable cost, but when you're surrounded by a number of private providers who are providing potentially luxury. So our new hall that we're looking to build, uh, which is we've been looking to build for about four or five years, probably about 700 spaces, but will be a tower uh, on one of our sites at Whitechapel where the medical school is. Um, the, the sort of planning scrutiny of that means that you're looking at a seven, eight, nine year phase to even get that off the ground. So in the short term, you're, you're looking at, you know, CBSA to provide you with some of it, but we're not as agile. So, you know, when we're looking at university numbers and projections and getting that all in a line and then saying, well, actually, we're going to need a shortfall of this amount of hall, all those rooms have gone because they're selling. And I know for a fact, because we had a meeting with one who we've got norms agreement with, that they're telling us that they're full in London and across most of the country because people and students are panicking and are booking and taking things. So there's so many, you know, it's a perfect storm almost at the moment, although we're getting more support and that joined up approach and we're working ever more closely than we were with colleagues in advice and counselling as it is here. Um, it, it's, it's really that retention side that's driving a lot of that. And there is more conversations happening with the academic sector than ever there was, but the absence of systems to join that up means it's not always able to pinpoint, as you were talking about um, your system, Lee, many years ago. I would love something like that. You know, we, we still struggle with the concept of me saying, well, we, can we move these things into the cloud so that we can try and have some discussions around getting a software that might enable a real time sort of response? But it's moving, but not as quickly, I think, is my summation on it. Over. That's really useful. 
Great. We've got just about five minutes. Is there any other questions from either um, the audience or even the panel? Is there anything else that you'd like to add on, Matty, uh, Mashudu or Lee? Is there anything else? I think just working together, you know, that's one of the things over 25 years I've I've found that, uh, you know, works really well and um, the ideas tend to be formed from these groups uh, quite often. So what Simon was referring to, we caught up at a conference a number of years ago and we were talking about, I had a, I had a, a spreadsheet um, which uh, I used to find out little nuggets of information from our student recruitment offices and then translate that into, okay, well, if this group at this age um, convert into a need for accommodation, that would help me plan my numbers and what I might need um, a bit earlier on in the cycle because the recruitment teams tend to be a bit economical with the facts and information um, throughout the recruitment cycle until it's a crisis uh, at the last minute and then they need loads of beds, which is always uh, stressful and fun uh, as a challenge. But yeah, I think that the, the more we work together and collaborate and um, I would probably say, you know, we, as I said, we're, we're not a technology company, but please feel free to reach out um, and uh, probably go for the whole panel there. Um, we've had uh, many years and um, many conversations and many challenges and many puzzles that we've solved between us. Uh, so whether it's um, housing, technology or, or well-being, uh, we, we're all on the same team, aren't we? We all want to improve it and move it forward and, and make it better. So, yeah, let's let's keep doing what we're doing and uh, and and continue to to advance and progress uh, and bring other colleagues on that journey with us whether they want to or not <laughs> yeah yeah i agree with that totally yeah and the key word collaboration we've mentioned that word quite a lot and i think it's quite a, a good point to finish there on that word of collaboration and continuing the conversation and and that's the idea of these calls through a cubo and a cure is that we bring people together not just within the uk but globally to share perspectives ideas and and uh, and knowledge too which is super important to us in the sector so um on that i'm going to Bring this webinar to a close. Um, the webinar will be on the QOI YouTube um, account quite soon, so you'll be able to watch it back. Um, but thank you again to uh, Mashudu, Lee, and Matty for all of your input and all of our audience. Um, thank you and have a great rest of your day. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. See you all very soon. Thank you. Bye bye.